Hey everybody, Tony D and little Joan here talking about comics. Jordan Peterson versus the Red Skull. I know everybody's talking about this meme and this whole thing. Uh, so I got to throw in my two cents. But before I get to that, uh, let me just thank everybody who came down to the Ocean City Comics and Memorabilia Show. It was a great show. I had a great day. Made a little... Uh, <laughs> And uh, sold some books, talked to fans. Um, you know, despite the masking up, that's still prevalent. Despite the social distancing, which was a little weird at a comic book show. Yeah, the tables were far apart, Joe. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was a really good show. I had a good time. Um, met a lot of people there. And I, I couldn't believe how good it was, quite frankly. I thought it was going to be a disaster. I just needed to get out of the house, but... It turned out to be great. So thank you. Uh, thanks to the Ocean uh, Ocean City uh, Public Library for putting it on. Hope to see you guys next year. All right, Joan. Here, you want to come over here? Yeah, two seconds into the video, you're already on my lap. Uh, and, you're, and you're red hot. You're red hot, doggy. I'm very hot from unloading the car of comics and books. So heavy. Anyhow, uh, Jordan Peterson and the Red Skull. So this has been going around, in case you don't know. Um, Tasha he Heaney Coates, I think that's how you say his name. Uh, I'll just call him Coates. Coates is the writer for Captain America. And he basically put Jordan Peterson-esque quotes and headlines and in, um, in an issue in which the Red Skull is now trying to use the internet to lure young men into his evil, evil ideology, which of course is fascism. But, um, as many people have pointed out, especially uh, RJ at the fourth age, um, you know, these guys, uh, first off, I don't think they have a real firm grip on what fascism actually is. They've created a new definition of fascism, and that's basically... As RJ says, anything that is from the past, essentially. Uh, the way he describes it, and you should watch his video today, it's really good. Anything that goes back. So if you want to go back to the 90s, as he said, as Tim Pool does, or back to, um, you know, a, a version of the Enlightenment, or back to more traditional values, you're fascist. They just... Progressives now call anybody who disagrees with them fascists and anybody who wants to go forward. Ah, you're on board. You're on board with the revolution. It's a whole long thing. You should um, uh, check it out for the ideology behind it. But I wanted to talk more about the nuts and bolts behind it as a guy who was in comics and a comic professional. And I'm sure probably Ethan Van Skyver has his own view on this. But uh, And I'm sure he's talked about it. But there is a way they hire writers and artists, okay? Now with artists, my experience has been, you know, it's almost pure talent in a lot of respects because I had a friend who, he was a really good artist and literally we're at a show, I went to the bathroom and when I came back, he told me, DC told him to come down to the offices on Monday and he was gonna start drawing Batman. That's how talented he was. And you can kind of see that in art sometimes. You can kind of see that in in guys who who draw and women too. I'm I'm, I'm saying guys in general. Calm down. Um, for writers, it's different. See, writers nobody reads anything. Not in Hollywood. Not in publishing. Not in comics. No one reads. No one. The readers read. <laughs> the people on the bottom who have to read are forced to read. Oh, they read. And they summarize to their boss and then they tell their boss, well, this is good or this is bad or this has the elements we want or this doesn't have the elements we want. But that's shifted over the years. So to tell you a quick story, uh, which I hope will be quick, I, I, I knew of a very famous, a guy who would become a very famous comic book writer. I won't say, I won't say who it is for reasons that you'll understand in a minute. This was in the 90s. Um, he was a New York guy. He had a New York agent. He was young and kind of handsome. Uh, he ran in the New York circles, which that's where these big comic book companies were at the time. He knew the right people. He had the right agent. They pitched him. He got in. He got a deal in which he got 
uh, a great deal of royalties based on sales right before uh, a huge spike happened on that company's books. So he was literally making $80,000 an issue as a bonus. That wasn't his living money. <laughs> he was getting that. This was on top of the money he was already making. Here, John, I'll put you down. You're just too hot. Whew, making me, making me sweat here. Um, so a lot of that ended up as no's, but that's a different story. But what you have to understand is he was what they wanted in terms of a look, not just in terms of his writing. His writing is almost superfluous because they want a guy they can present. They want... They want somebody they can tell a story about. They want somebody they can announce. At that time, it was the comic book press. It was places like Wizard Magazine. And Wizard, um, you know, what I heard, and again, all this is my opinion, based on rumors I heard at the time, uh, that, uh, you know, Wizard was really a scam to sell comics in a lot of ways because they would have this top ten list and they would put a couple of the comics they'd be sitting in, Tons of them on a warehouse, and then, you know, they say, oh, this is a hot comic. Well, we just happen to have 2,000 of them in the back warehouse, and they just happen to be, instead of $2 an issue, they're now $40 an issue. Wouldn't you like a copy? They're the hot thing. And that's how Wizard <laughs> kind of made some of its money, so I hear. So it wasn't, you know, the comic industry is not all gumdrops and rainbows. Um, so when he got in... You know, what was hot was Neil Gaiman, emo stuff, or proto-emo stuff, gothic stuff. And he kind of had that style. He kind of had that style to his writing. And that's why he was perfect. And that's why he blew up. And that's why, you know, he was a hit. Um, and that's why they kept him, despite his little uh, problem. Um, so when they get a guy like Ta-Nehisi Coates, Coates, whatever, T.C., when they get a guy like Coates, um, why do they pick him? He, as RJ points out, he obviously hates America. <laughs> and he's writing Captain America. Seems like that would be the wrong guy to pick. Well, you have to understand that the comic scene is not a New York scene anymore at all. It's a, an L.A. scene. Everything's been moved to L.A., which is way more woke. Always has been. You know, even in the 90s, it was way more woke. But there's also... A studio mentality to everything in LA and that's what they've put upon the comics except that we're not talking millions of dollars here anymore no 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 that happens in the movies or did um, when you're talking about comics you're not talking about that much money even now you know the books are tanking there's no big uh, royalties anymore they they're wise to that they don't want people collecting hundred thousand dollar checks from them if something hits they want the money so you know they're they're much much more corporate I believe than they were so why do they pick a guy like him it's because LA has a thing about subverting expectations you know and it and not to say that RJ's assessment of the progressive agenda isn't true. Totally is. I totally am buying into it. But it's also true that, um, you know, they hired the guys to write James Bond, like after Casino Royale, to deconstruct Bond in the movies. And that's what they did. And that's why the next couple of movies after Casino Royale are some of the worst things I've ever seen. Because they're trying to deconstruct Bond. They're trying to get him not to say the things that you expect him to say in a movie. Now, to some extent, that could be a thing. If you set it up like he's going to say something like, I'd like a martini, shaken, not stirred. And then he says something like, you know what? I don't think I have a bourbon. <laughs> just out of the blue. That could be fun, just for a change of pace. But that's not why they do it. But they've done it, they've done it to deconstruct bond and that's kind of what they're doing to captain america right they're deconstructing captain america they they ruined him as much as possible they made him a nazi and then they brought him back but it's not really him it's like a clone or something so when they pick a guy like Coates, they know exactly what they're doing and 
part of the reason they pick Coates is he is probably in their inner circle. So if you took a Venn diagram of my friend from the 90s, what you probably would have seen is circles of people who know each other in New York and they all interlap at some point and that's how they all know each other and network. Same thing with Coates, right? He worked at the Atlantic and the New Yorker, I think, a couple other places. There were other guys at Marvel who worked at those magazines, which probably means their agents are tied in to those magazines and Marvel and Disney, and they're all talking to each other, and they all go to the same parties, and that's how you don't hire a guy out of the blip. People rarely get hired in Hollywood because of their amazing talent. They get hired because they did something with it. Because otherwise, how would you know? These people are terrible judges of talent. <laughs> Most of them are terrible judges of talent. Agents especially. Because agents, they're not judges of talent. They're judges of what makes money. Now, some people who are talented do make a lot of money. But some people who are amazingly talented are just nothing but trouble. And you can see it. And if they're not handled just the right way, if you're not willing to tolerate them, and somebody else comes along who's easy to handle, he, he does crap, but you know it's going to make money. Which one are you going to pick? So in my view, that's why a lot of these guys get in. They happen to be in the right circles. They happen to have the same, right now, the hot thing are these political beliefs. That's the trend. Tanahishi Coates fits the trend. He's a person of color. He hates America. He's probably a full-blown communist if you talk to him, right? I, I don't know that. I'm just guessing. And he fits in perfectly with their worldview. Oh, it's going to be so subversive. Oh, the, oh you know, we're going to... And they don't think about the fans. Because in comics, they don't have to make money. They haven't had to make money in a long time. So if they're not servicing the fans, who are they servicing? Well, they're servicing the hired ups who are just as woke too. And they go, oh, that's so subversive. Ooh, I love it. That's the only people that matter, the people who dole out the green. <laughs> the people up top who, pay, who sign the paychecks, they're the only ones that matter. And right now, those people don't care about money. They only are, they're blinded by their ideology and they don't care. So you look at someone like, and I mentioned this yesterday, Kathleen Kennedy, in my view, an absolute train wreck of a studio person, should not be in charge of anything, wouldn't put her in charge of a half hour sitcom about a blank wall. And yet she's in charge of a billion dollar franchise that she didn't seem to do any favors, in my view. Again, all my speculation and opinion. So it's uh, it doesn't surprise me that they would hire him because it's outrageous and it gets people attention. And if they're not going to go for sales, then they got to go for attention, right? And you've got all these, again, women uh, running Marvel Comics. Women tend to see attention as a positive thing regardless of the kind of attention it is. <laughs> that uh, just think is ingrained in some women, not all. Some women could see beyond that and go, well, this attention, we're getting it, but down the road, this is going to kill us. But I don't think the particular women who are running Marvel Comics now can see past next week. They frequently contradict themselves on Twitter <laughs> uh, and some of their pronouncements. They and, and nobody cares about comics. They're cutting deals behind the scenes worth way more than the comics. So they don't care about them, in my view. That's my assessment. Again, I don't know that for sure, but I'm pretty sure there are, this is all educated guesses on my part. So, you know, from a nuts and bolts perspective, you know, when people get hired, they got to be in that clique. You know, the best way to get hired used to be hang out in the hotel bar at, at all the major comic book conventions. Get to know these guys. Buy them drinks. Be their buddy. Become their uh, assistant editors. And uh, I think uh, Peter David started out in the marketing department at Marvel. 
you know, just be in there. Just be around all the time until that moment happens. Like, oh, man, we got nobody to write the rest of Robin. The guy who was supposed to write it quit, and we got eight issues to go. Yeah, you want to write Robin? And there you go. That's your end. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to last. I knew a guy who got to write the Robin book for two years, and his career kind of just died after that. The books didn't go anywhere. He didn't seem to didn't see any gain any tractions his stories I guess weren't that good um, and the editors didn't particularly think he was anything special so part of it's uh, the marketing too if the editors don't like you and the, the 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 company doesn't like you now I had another friend who again ended up drawing big time comics they loved him <laughs> they put him front and center for a while uh, and then some problems happened which I won't go into so it's not just the ideology, although I think it's a lot of it. I think these people are pretty unprincipled when it comes to money. I mean, you look at the woman who ran BLM uh, or was one of the co-founders and just recently bought a house in Malibu for $1.4 million. It's a compound even. It's not even a house. It's a compound. Um, you know, does she really have, you know, does she really want to destroy capitalism? I don't think so. Uh, I wonder, I, I would severely question whether or not Mr. Coates would have such uh, animus towards America if it was 20 years ago and we just came hot off the heels of 9-11. No, I think he'd be writing, never forget comics, number one, which was a thing. Never forget 9-11, never forget, we're doing comics, America. And uh, that, it was a whole thing. It was the total opposite, waving flags and cheering on the military every day. Um, that was the trend until it died. And they milked it for all it's worth at that time. I think someone like Coates, if he didn't toe that line, he wouldn't get this opportunity to begin with. They'd find somebody else who would toe the line. Right now, the line is exactly what he apparently believes. Apparently. But... Quite frankly, I don't think progressives in general are very principled people. Uh, I haven't seen very many of them. The ones who are have probably left the progressive movement way behind at this point. Probably joined a little commune and realized, well, I can do my own little thing here on a farm and, you know, keep my corner of the world nice and green and then hopefully people will follow suit. I mean, that's really the way to do it. Not these phony baloney charity galas where the... 90% of the money goes into somebody's pocket and 10% goes down a rat hole and maybe gets to the poor. Um, you know, it's it's just the way of the world. So any big names, I would severely question. And, you know, it's a weird thing about comics. There is a tremendous amount of exposure. You know, I would tell people, hey, I, they'd say, what do you do? I'd say, well, I write comics. And they're like, really? <laughs> oh, I always wanted to do that. And I'd be like, why? Do you hate money? Um, but some of these guys, you know, they they would get tremendous amount of exposure. And I do too, to, to my own little extent. But, uh, you know, if you look at the guys, I, would, I also worked in games and role-playing games. And those guys would ask me all the time, oh, man, you worked in comics. We, uh, we wish we could get into the comics business. And I would be like, why? And they would say, because people remember who you are, and they don't remember us, which is true. In the world of games, eh, the creators tend not to be mem remembered, especially in role-playing games. But in comics, you're kind of like a little mini-god, a deity, if you will. Uh, so there is some prestige in that. And I think that's part of why these progressives have taken over comics, because they love the prestige. Uh, in this case, though, I think it's imagined prestige because they've crushed their audience so badly, all they have left is the hate. And so now they revel in the hate because there's nothing else to revel in. Nobody reads the damn things anymore. Nobody wants to. Everybody just wants to complain about them. So, so uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm far out of that, that field now. You know, I worked at Bongo, which was a great atmosphere for the most part. Uh, pretty much stayed true to The Simpsons while I was involved in it anyway. And, uh, you know, Matt Granig actually ran the company. You know, he was the head muckety-muck. And 
and controlled the uh, uh, things going on. I met him a couple of times at uh, San Diego. It was cool. Um, but, you know, that's just not the case anymore. These companies are the arms of multi-million dollar, you know, entertainment juggernauts. And they're, they're just a tiny division in this mon uh, leviathan of money. So they're not that important. So if you think they're going to care about the fans or the characters, I don't really think, you know, I think that's a far, far, far flung hope. Even further than it was back in the heyday when these comic books were at least semi-independent. So people are moving on. And it's just hilarious that they go after Jordan Peterson because Peterson is just trying to do, be honest and, and teach honesty and discipline to, and structure to people who don't have it. He's just trying to be a helpful guy and they're trying to destroy him for it. They're calling him literally a fascist for it. And it just goes to show you how out of touch they really are. I think uh, Coates and all, all the Marvel staff, they're incredibly out of touch. They have no idea the next wave coming. They think it's more wokeness. <laughs> and the revolution! <laughs> no. It is the structure returning. The snapback of the anti-woke. One way or another, it's happening. Um, you know, their imagined revolution, no. Not going to come to pass. Um, but it's funny. And, you know, for me, I'm just going to stick to my own comics. Thank you very much. The Web Comic Factory, the anti-war comic, is today. This is a little ditty I call The War on Racism. Starring Joe Biden. Uh, so check that out at the webcomicfactory.com and on to the next video.